So I guess it's time that we get started. <clears throat> also gives me the opportunity to say good morning. If I wait three more minutes, it's too late for that. <laughs> Hi, everyone, <clears throat> and welcome to the presentation about, well, let's say, open source business models. Let me start by introducing myself a little bit. Um, I've been doing open source from the developer perspective as an active developer since 93. I started using open source even earlier. Okay, admittedly, back then it was only free software. Nobody heard, nobody came up with the idea of open source before then. Um, so I did some work on the Linux kernel, on GNU tools, then uh, became a Debian de um, developer and a Postgres developer and still am in those positions. So um, there's quite a bit of history from the community perspective. But also on the, let's call it business side, as you can see from the numbers, I um, started doing most of my free software work while working on my PhD, the classical way, you're still at uni, even if you're working, you have more time, you have to take care of your own system, but no money available for buying anything, so you start improving what is there. Um, then got into different businesses. Uh, the main point, the 24 years creditive, uh, pure open source company, services and support, so just you, you get where I'm coming from. Um, then we merged with Insect Cluster, was acquired by NetApp, and now, technically starting at the end of the month, I'm out of that position and semi-retired, um, looking out and willing to help people to accomplish something in open source, be it on the community side or even on entrepreneurship. If somebody has questions, feel free. Before I go into the content into the technical details here, one short housekeeping note. If somebody has a question, feel free to interrupt me. Um, raise your hand so I can see it or just find a way to alert us or me. I very much prefer to talk about the question while we're at the topic instead of just going through the whole presentation then then return 20 slides uh, backwards just to talk about it. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> this is an, an article that was, well, part of an article that was uh, published, I don't know, this month, last month, at ACM. Um, I'm not saying I really agree with everything they say, and I have no idea why an article about open source in general um, reference Windows Vista, because Vista is by comparison fairly new. Um, but still, the point the author is making, <clears throat> um, and the slides are, by the way, uploaded, so uh, feel free to take pictures, but if you want to have the whole slide deck, it's available on the, on, on the schedule website. Um, so the point he's making is, if there had been a Unix system available that worked and was reasonably priced, the whole movement wouldn't have happened. Linux wouldn't have started Linux, and all the rest wouldn't have fallen into places. I don't necessarily agree with that, and I think there are some very strong arguments why he's wrong. But it also got a point when you, look, uh, when you look at the system, and the main point to me is this one. When we're talking, when we're talking about business models, open source is not the business model. Open source should be, as the slide says, part of your strategy. There are huge, really huge advantages of being open source versus being proprietary. But just saying we want to be open source is not the solution. Is not You still have to come up with a business model how to monetize your open source or how to use open source to monetize something. But let's have a short look at the, the beginning of the whole, well, endeavors. This is um, a picture, I think it's Berkeley. Uh, somebody from the area could verify, no, nobody here. Yeah, is it Berkeley? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, but I could have put any other university in there. Uh, back in the 80s, 90s, this is where free software was done. 
And this is the normal way for universities. It's not, universities don't work by keeping their stuff proprietary. Universities and research work is, in essence, sharing information. And it was very, very normal for those universities to share code. That was before there was any business idea. And let's have a look at some of those projects. Um, just in case not everyone knows everyone on the, pic, uh, on the slide here, to your left, that's Michael Stonebreaker, who started the Postgres project. That's why Berkeley, Postgres uh, came out of Berkeley. He also started Ingress and a certain amount of other uh, uh, things. The next one is um, Richard Thorman. Uh, copyright has moved a little bit up. Richard Thorman, I assume everyone knows who Richard Thorman is. Linus, of course, everyone should know too. He's, he is or was here at least. And this is Ian Murdoch, uh, the guy who started Debian. But again, Richard was working at MIT, I think, when he started doing Emacs, GNU Emacs as kind of the first free software thing. Linus was a student. Ian was, I think it was Purdue. I don't know which university he was working on when he started uh, Debian. So again, it came out of university. But then at some point, um, you would look at uh, monetizing it. So there are essentially two ways of doing it. You can support the usage of the open source by offering services or deployment help or whatnot. Um, or you can use it as a toolbox to build a product. Now the extreme case here is obviously the product is completely open source and not just a part of it. But more on that later. Quickly back to the four gentlemen I showed you. Um, I mentioned Postgres, the research project. Uh, that was sourced out or they started the company called Elastra out of Berkeley, which was then acquired by Informix and then acquired by IBM. So essentially, nowadays, IBM's DB2 code has parts of the original Postgres. Um, but this is a permissive license thing. They usually, obviously, the BSD license uh, coming from there. They could do whatever they want with the software. And we're going to go back to that topic later. Um, there are an awful lot of offshoots of Postgres uh, with advantages and disadvantages. The one disadvantage versus the copyleft projects listed down here is because everyone can do everything they want with the software, you need policies and guidelines what you can do within the project. While the GPL gives you already gives you most of the, the policies and the guidelines. So CopyLab Debian was uh, uh, GPL has, well, Ubuntu is the best known fork of Debian, if you want to call it a fork. But according to DistroWatch, there are 125 more. Uh, no idea why we need so many distributions for Linux, but OK, so be it. And then, of course, Linux kernel. All the hardware vendors, literally everyone uses and works on the Linux kernel. And again, because it's GPL, um, there is no way for one hardware vendor to just take the code and run with it and make significant changes just for their own hardware and say, we have the better kernel. It's not possible. Well, it's possible, and sometimes people try to do that, but it's not legal to do it. Let's put it that way. <clears throat> So let me go to, um, to business models in general. Again, we are talking about the beginning of the movement. We're talking about the, mid, the late 90s, maybe the early 2000s. The first thing, where am I? Ah. Um, the first thing that comes to mind and the first thing that the, came into the market, obviously, was services. It's fairly easy. You can easily set up a services company. The risk is rather low as compared to a product company. And you don't need huge funding to set up a company like that. 
The 90s showed you can also start big by raising capital and then building a huge services company. Some of those were, let's say, a bit early for the market. Uh, and some had a weird approach. I remember one CEO once telling me, it's easy, you raise the capital, then you hire everyone you know who has any uh, subject matter experience, who knows anything about open source, and then you start looking for jobs for them. Wait. <laughs> uh, yeah, it didn't work out, they went bust, no surprise there. But keep in mind back then, most of the experts were self-taught people, were people who used open source and developed open source at universities or in their spare time at home. And they didn't have a job in open source because there weren't many. Um, so talent was available on the market. You could hire them. You could bootstrap your company. You get the expertise. You get the talent. Um, and the, the users, the companies using open source, didn't have much expertise in terms of open source because it was so new. They were, literally needed help on everything. Um, but very soon people realized we need more talent than what the people who just came out of school and enjoyed the software so much that worked on it. So the other thing that came up fairly early was training and certification. Well, training first, obviously. Certification is not that easy because you need kind of a consensus of what you need and what you need to prove and everyone needs to accept that certification. Um, I really like this analogy, so I, have, I guess I have to explain it because most people probably haven't seen me talk about that topic. Before going into the open source space, I have a history doing quality management in IT for a short period. And the one thing we did back then was ISO 9000, 9001 certifications. Well, actually, the customers that we were just part of the, the movement. And everyone was like, yeah, we need to get ISO 9000 certified. That shows the product is good, blah, blah, blah. Problem is, ISO certification 9000 series only certifies the processes, not the product quality. And this is the common example. Everyone knows a life vest. But I can't create that life vest out of concrete and get it ISO 9000 certified. No deal. It's easily doable. It's actually easier than the real life vest because I don't have to worry about a return process. Once it's used, it's never coming back. <clears throat> so when you go for a certification, make sure it makes sense, not just because somebody claims that's good. Back in the 90s, we had the Microsoft certified engineer thing. For a while, the German government thought it's a great idea to have everyone certified who's out of a job. Not just IT people, everyone who was looking for a job and couldn't find one got into MCSE training. And then they were really clever. They only paid the training companies if they passed the certification test. Imagine how many people actually passed, like everyone. So at the end of the day, when people applied for a job and said, I'm a certified MCSE, the reaction of human resources was, so what? I don't care. Do you actually know how to switch on a computer? <laughs> um, it's not worth the effort. Microsoft found out, changed it. So that worked, the market worked there. And the same thing happens with certifications in the open source space. We've seen something that was just plain not worth the effort. And we've seen something come up that really made sense. <clears throat> Let's switch to the product side or the software side. Um, this looks a, kind of a bit complicated, but when you look at it uh, closer, it's pretty well understood and you can easily get the gist of it. Companies usually know what is open source and what is closed source and where they can move around in this area. Um, and it's not just for IT. I mean, I don't know where you all work, but I'm pretty sure uh, not everyone is in an IT company and still you use open source or you have the need to start looking into open source or whatever. So this information everyone needs to know, to some extent at least. Um, 
we got to the point where being open source became a selling point. Um, to the point where somebody actually approached me and told me that their ERP system was open source now. What? Oh, that's great. Um, what did you do? How did you do it? Yeah, well, it runs on SUSE now. Yeah, so what? Yeah, then it's open source, right? <laughs> um, no, <laughs> not even close. Um, but they use that as a marketing argument for selling the software. It's fine to say, hey, my software is great. It runs on Linux now. Excellent. But don't claim it's open source. But unfortunately, we're seeing the same things because companies are still trying to lock in their customers. Um, open Core is, I think, the most prominent example. Everyone here who doesn't know what Open Core means? Okay. So the basic idea behind it is you have something, the core of the software that you open. It's open source. It's available for each and every one. And then you have enterprise-grade features attached that are not open source, that are proprietary. So you can have like, I don't know, a Postgres database that's completely open source, and then you have that Oracle compatibility layer attached, that's not open source. Fine, you can still use the whole database. You can get it from somebody else, you're perfectly safe. You can also do it like, everyone remember HP Open Mail that became then Scalix? They had a very weird approach. They also open sourced their core server but there was literally no way of using the server without some of their proprietary extensions. So then, it's simply not worth the effort. It's not really open source. And the bigger issue is, when you use those additional proprietary features that are added, you're locked in the same way as if you're doing proprietary software from the get-go. It doesn't make a difference. Um, it's still the same old vendor lock-in approach that software companies have. As a company back, well, last 25 years, we did a lot of Postgres work, obviously me being a Postgres guy and so on. There was a time when we did more Postgres migration from Enterprise DB's open core Postgres version to real Postgres than we did from any other database in the market. A lot of users got into using their version of Postgres and then figuring out, why are we still paying somebody we don't use those features anyway? So if we want to do open source, let's do fully open, go, let's go fully open source. And then the other approach is um, dual licensing. Um, that means all features are available in the open source version, but you're only allowed to use the open source version in, version in a certain context. There is another license that regulates what you are allowed to do in a commercial environment. MySQL is the prime example, which, by the way, brought me to become a Postgres developer. I wanted to contribute, and MySQL said, no, we are not accepting patches. If your idea is good, we will re-implement it. Because we have the dual licensing, we have to be the owner of the IP. As a private person, you're allowed to use the MySQL for whatever you want. But if you're a company and you need like 100 database servers, you have to pay Oracle. Well, back then MySQL, but now Oracle. Um, there's an explanation on the slide. I'm not going to, uh, to read that to you. If somebody has an interest, uh, this is done by, um, I think, the first professor for open source we ever had, at least in Germany. I'm not sure Dirk is here. I've never, I haven't seen him yet. But anyway. Um, if you want to um, learn a bit more about it, just take the slide deck, read up on it, and there's plenty to be found. One small warning, for whatever reason that I cannot figure out, Wikipedia thinks dual licensing and open core is one and the same. I have no idea why. I, I didn't want to change Wikipedia without any discussion, so don't be surprised about that. Okay, so now, now to what we really want to talk about, the cloud came, or oh, the calm before the storm. Uh, the cloud changes everything, or so, or not. We'll figure that out. Um, 
at least some approaches change. And that's also one thing that's kind of funny in the IT uh, sector, because IT seems to go in cycles. We have a distributed, then we concentrate again, then we distribute again, and then we concentrate again. This time we didn't concentrate on a single server in our data center, but we concentrated <laughs> on a huge server farm in the provider's data center. Actually, I'm not sure I like that approach, because once that data center falls off the grid, we all have a problem, but different topic. The thing is, when the, the cloud movement started, um, and most people didn't even know what, what it really is, it was essentially a virtualization thing. The first step was offering VMs for everyone to run on our hardware that is available anyway. So we have the big three cloud providers, Google with all their stuff, Microsoft with Hotmail back then, and, and Amazon with their big retail thing. They all had more computing power available than they could actually use, but they still needed it just for peak usage. And somebody came up with the idea, why not selling that computing power to, to the rest of the world? But also, we've seen quite a bit of that virtualization thing on-prem. Um, the cloud providers, well, at least Google and Amazon, from the immediate get-go were using open source virtualization. Microsoft obviously used their own Hyper-V. Um, on the on-prem situation, we still, to the day, see a lot of VMware. Who was, probably VMware was the first one to get into that area. Um, does anyone run VMware in your company? Did you get a nice message from Broadcom about new license cost? Yeah. So, again, somebody took over the company, it's proprietary, you're at their mercy essentially, and then they figure we need to get more money from our customers, and you've got an issue. What happens now in the open source space is a lot of companies come by and say, well, this is too ridiculously expensive. There are, available, there are uh, alternatives available in open source. Can we talk about it? So now you see Proxmox getting an uptick. You see OpenStack that everyone considered to be already dead uh, get an uptick. Yeah, there's life in the old dog. It's just, it's needed now. It hasn't been needed in that version before, but now there's a big need in the market. And then the other thing that happened is the cloud kept developing. It's not just the virtualization thing. The provider starting, started to collaborate on everything that's not distinguishing. We see it in every single industry. I mean, we have the, the automotive people here. Um, there are so many software things where the car makers work together because it's not a different, uh, differentiation. If the, the graphical user face in your car is different, you might consider the better user interface to buy the, that car instead of this one here. Yeah? But the basic operating system below, you don't care because you don't touch it anyway. And the same happens in, in the cloud space. Um, some technology, I mean, looking at containers, Kubernetes, doesn't even exist outside of open source. I'm not sure if there's something similar to containers in Windows now, but originally, but they claim to be contain, uh, containers were essentially VMs. So they're much bigger. So right now, a lot of companies, if not all, if they set up a new system, a new design, it's always container-based. Everything runs in Kubernetes. We get like second level cloud providers, the new ones coming up, who don't even offer VMs anymore where everything is Kubernetes and you can get your own infrastructure, you can get your container set up, but it's only that, nothing else. Or in other words, nowadays, open source on that, in that area is the norm and not the exception. And then we get IoT and Edge. Um, it's kind of interesting, preparing for this presentation, I did some research to get uh, market share numbers to on uh, uh, operating systems on IoT devices. The only thing I could find 
We're excluding Linux because otherwise the numbers don't make sense. It's literally like 80, 90% is standard Linux and the rest is then very, very small. And even the rest is mostly open source. We have like one or two embedded systems uh, that are proprietary, but almost everything is open source. Yes, if you have a single sensor, maybe there's no full operating system on it. Forget about that. But once you have a full operating system, you can bet it's an open source system. And then we have Edge. Obviously, we need something to do all the calculation. We don't want to do it on the IoT devices, everything, and we don't want to push it too far into the cloud. So essentially, Edge is nothing else but a cloud-like environment closer to the device. And again, it's the same as cloud computing from the technology perspective. The scale changes, no big deal, but also the location changes. That means if you want to have your edge system on-prem versus in some data center that might be in Ireland when you're living here, I don't know, um, you set things up in your own data center using the same, same technologies. And as we already discussed, there is no way to do all of that without open source. And especially in this area, you see a lot of microservice setups, which makes an awful lot of sense. But again, microservices, I have no idea how to do that with pure proprietary software without using open source. Or in other words, it doesn't really matter. Everyone is using open source nowadays. Most of us have it in, the, in their pocket anyway, at least the Android users. Um, but chances are everyone has some piece of open source with them nowadays. Literally everyone, not just in the room. But not only the technology changed, we also see changes in business approaches in the cloud. So let's start with the first one, services. My, my, my best friend, the services. Um, I remember being at a think tank 2012-ish, before Azure was really online. Um, and we were having those classical roundtable discussions. We were really sitting on the table discussing a topic. And one of the guys on my table at my table was a product manager for Azure. And what, what surprised me most back then was that even back then, he told me that we are very well aware the most open cloud wins. We want to be absolutely open towards open source, which for Microsoft, 12, 15 years back was a very interesting statement. But also, there was a guy sitting right next to me. After the Microsoft person explained to us how the cloud would work and what they do, he looked at me and said, oh, I'm sorry, guy. Uh, why? Yeah, because your business is going to go away. Nobody needs services anymore. Oh, contraire. Um, nobody, we had so much more inquiries about services than before cloud. Yes, the standard ticket changed. Nobody asked for setting up backup system for your database anymore because the cloud provider has it covered. But even if they claim they do fully managed, it's the managing means I in, install the software for you and I upgrade the software, but it doesn't mean I check your data in your database. If the query is too slow, I tune it for you. No way, that doesn't happen. They don't install your software on the container. They don't make the desi design for your Kubernetes setup, and, and, and. Which makes sense. Why should the provider uh, do this work? That they're not in the business of doing that. Um, but still, it's, it's not fully managed in the sense that the user thinks of it as fully managed. Um, or in other words, the cloud providers don't replace admin, admins. Um, the users ask for different, need, uh, different services, and that's exactly why services are still needed in the same level or higher level. The traditional cloud business was um, infrastructure as a service, essentially. Compute, storage, and <coughs> network. Everything else was your thing. Um, and this is essentially still how the cloud providers make their money. But it's so much easier for them to offer additional features, and you don't even realize that you're essentially buying compute storage and network. 
if you go for any software as a service, you get the software with everything included. They still make the money because you, get, you use their uh, infrastructure. So the cloud providers figured out they can actually expand their user base dramatically by offering more features. In this case, in my case, again, Postgres as a service. So the database is run by the provider. As a user, you don't have to worry about anything. You can start using the database. You still need your DBA, but that's it. The best thing for cloud providers here is using open source software for offering those services because they don't have to pay licenses. If as a, a cloud provider you want to run Oracle, you have to pay Oracle. But if you want to run Postgres, no problem. Same thing with Linux distributions. If you run everything on Debian, um, easy. It doesn't cost you anything. If you want to run anything, everything on Red Hat, you have to pay IBM every single time a VM comes up or a container is used. So the providers started using open source even more than before. At the same time, for software vendors, this happened. The software as a service approach really changed valuation for companies. When you're a service company, you might be somewhere in the factor two, with a lot of recurring revenue, maybe three. The standard multiplier for a software company is around five-ish. Um, that means five times your revenue is the value of the company. Or the SaaS company, it's 10 times. <clears throat> that means as a software vendor, you have a very vested interest in becoming a SaaS vendor because that's where the money is to be had, especially given that a lot of those companies are venture capital funded and the venture capital company will be looking for an exit. <clears throat> so what happens is everyone wants to do SaaS. Um, the hyperscalers make money by selling computer and storage. They don't, they're independent of what the uh, software the customer use. Um, they keep selling what they sell, and this is the classical statement in the Gulf Rush, sell shovels. The companies who did sell the shovels became rich in any gold, every gold rush. The gold diggers, well, most of them didn't. And this is what happens here. Um, for the cloud provider, they don't really care which software works and which one doesn't. They still sell it. For them, it's very, very easy. <clears throat> um, so, the reason, again, the business perspective of using open source in that area is it's still better to do that, especially for a cloud provider, but for everyone else, it's better for, to do that than using, uh, starting your own development, which takes much longer, it costs much more, um, or buy some third-party software, again, much more expensive. So now the problem came up that the... Um, the cloud provider started using open source software that was only developed by one company. Um, be it Redis, be it Elasticsearch, there are a lot of examples about that. Um, so different to the uh, projects I talked about earlier, there is no real community around those, or well, was, I should say. So what happens, um, or what should happen, the open source way is, we will start collaborating on that software. It's fairly easy. Um, the usual business reaction is make sure our IP stays our IP and nobody else monetizes it without us getting any share of it. So while the open source people might say we want that software to be available for everyone, somebody will come in and say, probably a lawyer or uh, some business people, we don't make enough money. We have to make more money. We have so many users, but we don't make the money. So um, the, what happens or happened quite a bit is uh, license changing. I mentioned Elasticsearch and Redis. Terraform is another one. Um, so the companies came up with the idea of not being open source anymore or being, well, download, source code available, proprietary license, whatever. And then what happened is 
in those projects that were really successful in the market, the communities around it, the user communities, started to fork the software. Now we see Redis as Valky, it's here, Terraform is Open Tofu, some are here probably as well. Elasticsearch is a very special case because um, Amazon led the effort to make it open search. We're also here, of course. Um, and, but just recently, this month, last month, Elasticsearch figured it doesn't work the way they thought. And now they are doing open source again. Um, because they love open source so much that they always wanted to do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what the statement said. Um, I have no insight. Uh, uh, sorry, you said. Yeah, no, no. Uh, but uh, do you think these companies that do this, do you think they plan it in advance, or do you think it's more like a circumstance? They realize they're not making some money and then they change their mind? I, no, I think they didn't plan it in advance. They realized that, and uh, several times over the course of the decades, you see that there was a management change before the change in license. Um, as in, okay, the company isn't developing the way it should, bring in new management and new management because it's from whatever classical finance industry or whatever, say, oh wait, yeah, it's, sure, it doesn't work because we don't lock the customers in. So let's change that. And the movement by Elasticsearch to me tells me, uh, it's pretty obvious it doesn't work, and they try to turn it around. I, I wouldn't expect this to work out. And, uh, do you think it will occur more as open source is adopted more widely? Uh, yes. But I think we, as an um, uh, open source community, we have the power to make sure it stays open source, and it's still a viable model. It's just because, I mean, yeah, if you, if you raise, I don't know, let's say 100 million, you still have to get the company to a value of a billion to make sense for your venture capital. And that means you have to get to a revenue of, let's say, 100 million if you do this. Even if you do 50, it's not sufficient. If that's the number you have to get to, you have to get there. And sometimes people do crazy stuff, if you ask me. I don't like it, but I like the way the open source world reacted and forked things and really started getting projects done and getting building a community and putting it into like the LF, for example, um, to make it part of a large community. That's the best thing that could happen. And then obviously what happens is the classical old way of the companies start disc to discredit competition, uh, spread FUD and so on. We've seen that for 30 years because people who are not from IT and not from open source don't understand open source. Try to explain the business model of giving away something for free to a banker when you ask for a loan. It's kind of tricky. <clears throat> um, and I mentioned VMware before. It's a similar situation. They didn't change the license because they didn't have to but they just increased the pricing, the license price so much that a similar thing happens. Instead of forking, because it's not open source, you cannot fork, you see open source projects taking over the space and building features that might be lacking because VMware has them. What does it mean for the cloud and open source? Um, the most open cloud wins, and we had that before, um, I think the way companies try to protect their open source software can create more real open source. Again, we had those examples. That, but that means the ecosystem grows. We get more out of open source. We get more features. We get more software. We get a larger opportunity there. There is not a guaranteed outcome. It might happen that some company is successful proprietary or making the software proprietary again. Sure. But in most of those cases, when they are successful, it's because um, there was no real open source market available anyway. You need somebody to put the effort in and start that project, and you need to know how to do it. There are companies out there who think we just throw our software over the wall and then there's a community. No, communities don't appear magically. You have to put work into it. <clears throat> 
And then just, I think I'm running out of time. Actually, I already ran out of time. Um, one more short word about um, what does it mean for the open source system. It's rather important for us um, that we have communities around it, not just a single company handling something. So that's why open core and dual licensing are not what we want to do. We want to have a way that there is a community <clears throat> that if something happens to some company, we can actually keep it going. Um, for maybe let me let me finish on a very well, not so funny side note. Talk to way back when I talked to a bank about some software and some improvements, and they were like, "Yeah, you know the saying: if the developer has a motorcycle accident and so on, yeah, it really happened to us." And this was just the one. Yeah, he's the only one knowing the software. And just to finish that up, the software was for risk management. I kid you not. But what we get is, this is, by the way, the Debian uh, developer conference this year, and actually last month. Um, we get more people into the open source world. We get more um, people training on the job, training in training situations, we get more people just being interested in learning it at universities and everything. So we get more people in, we get more companies becoming interested because there's a business model there. And by that, I almost finished on time. <laughs> Any other question? Okay, then enjoy your lunch.